Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the hottest news relating to space launches, space news and space history through the decades. We've had quite the week, from launches aimed for low Earth orbit to rockets with payloads bound for the moon. Before making a formal start though, as always, make sure you've hit that subscribe button down below to ensure you get notified of when these videos release so that your news content is as up to date and relevant as possible. And with that, let's just transition over to our first segment of the show, all the news that happened last week. Our first launch of the week took place on Monday the 23rd when China successfully launched their beefy Long March 5 rocket from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site. On board was the Chang'e 5 lunar lander, which is a robotic probe designed to return lunar surface samples back to Earth. The lander is currently en route to the moon and I do hope the rest of the mission proceeds as successfully as the launch. Next up, we saw SpaceX launch one of their trusty Falcon 9 rockets carrying the latest batch of Starlink satellites on Wednesday the 25th. The launch was postponed from the 23rd, but it was nice to see that this wasn't an extended delay and that we got to see the flight proceed as planned. The first stage booster touched down on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship just over 8 minutes after launch, marking the seventh successful landing of this particular booster, a new record for SpaceX. The 60 Starlink satellites were deployed from the second stage around 15 minutes after launch. The fairings weren't caught in the net of the fairing catcher ship Miss Chief, but both were fished out from the water later. Starlink is a fairly frequently occurring topic on this channel due to the high frequency of launches, but if you're new to this sort of thing, then Starlink is SpaceX's mega constellation with which they hope to provide high-speed satellite internet on a near global scale. This latest batch of satellites will definitely help contribute towards this goal, and it's always fun watching Falcon 9's launch and land. Also on Wednesday, Rocket Lab released more awesome footage from their Return to Sender mission. While this flight took place a couple of weeks ago now, it was still a very cool mission and this newly released footage of second stage separation is definitely worth sharing in my opinion. We also saw some more pictures of that recovered first stage as Rocket Lab continue to process and study the booster as they take their steps in making Electron a partially reusable launch system, much like the Falcon 9. Our final launch was on Sunday the 29th. We saw Japan's H2A204 launch successfully from the Tanegashima launch site. On board was a LUCAS satellite. LUCAS is an acronym that stands for Laser Utilizing Communication System. And this particular satellite was a Japanese optical data relay. This is Japan's first optical relay satellite with a laser communications payload. And it will sit in geosynchronous orbit and relay signals between low Earth Earth orbit satellites and ground stations. But those were all the launches we were treated to last week, so let us now wander over to Boca Chica, Texas to check on how SpaceX are getting on with their Starship. And my goodness, this week has been eventful. Starship serial number 9 has now been fully stacked inside the high bay. SN10 and SN11 continue undergoing tank section stacking in the mid bay. SN12 to 14 are in the early phases of production and SN15's barrel and dome segments are being fabricated. The first Starship Super Heavy booster is also coming along nicely, being stacked alongside the SN9 inside the high bay. On screen is another awesome render by Brendan Lewis, which gives you a comprehensive overview of where we stand with each of these Starship and Super Heavy prototypes. Great stuff. Check out his Twitter and Patreon using the links provided in the video description. Of course, you all know I've been delaying the thing you want to hear about, the Starship SN8. We were initially a bit worried about when this beast would take to the skies after its static fire test on November 12, which ended with a bad shutdown of the Raptor engines with damage to the rocket's underside. Luckily, the damage was related to pad debris and not some fundamental issue with the rocket itself, and after engine repairs and replacements were carried out, the SN8 performed a fourth static fire test on the 24th of November, this time without a hitch. With this success under their belt, SpaceX now want to launch the SN8 15 kilometers skyward on the 30th of November. That's today, if you're watching this video when it comes out. Incredibly exciting stuff, hopefully it goes as well as anticipated as this amazing animation by Corey shows. Again, link to his Twitter and YouTube channel are in the description below. Backup road and beach closure days are on the 1st and 2nd of December, so hopefully by Thursday at the very latest, we'll have been able to bear witness to this historic flight. 
Man, we sure have come a long way from that first Starhopper flight, but that test was only about a year ago, so it's incredible to think just how much progress SpaceX have made over such a short amount of time. But those were all the launches and events that we saw last week, so now it's time to segue over to our next segment, all of the launches planned for the next seven days. But before we do that, you know I've got to shamelessly ask that if you're enjoying this video so far, then please remember to leave a like, helps us out at zero cost, and it's always appreciated. Anyway, to the future we ride! <laughs> Our first launch is scheduled for today, November the 30th, and will be the launch of an Ariane space-operated Soyuz rocket expected to launch from the Guiana Space Center in South America. We had hoped to see this fly on November the 28th, but the launch was rescheduled to today due to a poor weather forecast. On board the Soyuz will be a Falcon I-2 high-resolution Earth imaging satellite on behalf of the United Arab Emirates. This will be the second Falcon I-2 satellite launched for the UAE. The Falcon I-2 satellites are built by Airbus Defence and Space and Theos Alenia Space and are built for optical military reconnaissance. Our next flight is another Soyuz launch, this time from the Plesetska Cosmodrome on the 4th of December, carrying three Russian Gonit-M satellites that will join the Gonit satellite constellation, which is a Russian communication satellite system. Much like the last Soyuz launch, this was delayed from last week as well, so hopefully things proceed as planned this time. Our next launch will be on the 4th of December and will be another Russian rocket, this time an Angara A5. Again delayed from last week, this will be the second ever flight of the Angara A5 rocket, which will be carrying a test payload. The Angara class of rockets are still very much in development and will eventually replace Russian's Proton launch system once they're ready to enter service. The mighty Angara A5 will have a payload capacity of 24.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit, almost a whole ton more than the Proton. Here's hoping the launch goes without a hitch. On Saturday the 5th of December, we have two launches from two different continents. The first will be a Falcon 9 and will be a resupply mission for the International Space Station, meaning that if this launch goes ahead as planned, there will be two Dragons docked to the space station. This ain't your regular old resupply mission though, as in addition to the Cargo Dragon, the Falcon 9 will also be carrying a brand new International Space Station module. This module is called the Bishop Airlock and is a commercially funded airlock module that will be used to deploy CubeSats, small satellites, and other external payloads. The name refers to the Bishop chess piece, which moves diagonally. The module will attach to the Tranquility module, and it doesn't have any hatches. Instead, the Canadarm2 can connect to one of its two grapple fixtures in order to move the airlock on or off the station's berthing port, which does have a hatch. Because it has two grapple fixtures, the airlock can be moved up to the mobile base system along the main truss of the space station. All in all, very exciting stuff, and I can't wait to see SpaceX hopefully pull this one off successfully. The second launch on the 5th will be from China and will be a Long March 3BE, taking off from the Zichang Space Center. On board will be a GFN-14 satellite, which is a Chinese Earth observation satellite. It'll be placed in geosynchronous orbit. Our final launch of the week is an Indian PSLV rocket. I can't show footage of this because the Indian government keeps copyright claiming me for using video of their launches, so here's a video of a cute kitten instead. <laughs> On board is a CMS-01 satellite, which is an Indian communication satellite designed to replace the aging GSAT-12 and will be used to provide services such as tele-education, telemedicine, disaster management support, and satellite internet access. If the launch proceeds as planned, it'll be placed in GeoCity synchronous orbit. But that's all the launches that we expect to see this week, so without further ado, let's transition to our final segment of the show, all the best historic space anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. Our first anniversary of the week is today, Monday the 30th of November, when, in the year 2000, NASA launched STS-97. This was the 101st Space Shuttle mission and was the flight of Space Shuttle Endeavour. And it's a particularly significant flight because not only did its mission involve the fitting of the first solar arrays to the Young International Space Station, but it would also be the final human spaceflight of the 20th century. Endeavour would continue serving NASA for some 10 years more, completing its final flight in June 2011. 
Also on November the 30th, but this time all the way back in 1954, we have a fairly unusual story. In Sylacauga, Alabama, United States, the now-named Sylacauga meteorite crashed through the roof of a farmhouse and hit a sleeping Ann Hodges, after whom the meteor would be nicknamed. The Hodges meteorite is the only documented case in the Western Hemisphere of a human being hit by a rock from space, making Miss Hodges a member of an extremely exclusive club. Tomorrow, December the 1st, marks the 1984 anniversary of the Controlled Impact Demonstration, nicknamed the Crash in the Desert Test, which was a joint project between NASA and the Federal Aviation Administration that involved deliberately crashing a remotely controlled Boeing 720 aircraft to gain data and test new technologies to aid passenger and crew survival in the event of a plane crash. While not technically spaceflight related, I will take literally any opportunity to show this amazing slow motion footage of the crash. I mean, I mean, look at that. Look at that. Isn't that... Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Next up, we have a few anniversaries on December the 3rd, the first of which is in 1973, when Pioneer 10 sent back the first ever close-up images of Jupiter. These far exceeded the quality of any previous photos of Jupiter taken from Earth, and the Pioneer program would later receive an Emmy Award for their presentation of the photographs to the media. The same day, in 1999, a less successful NASA anniversary takes place. This was the day that the Mars Polar Lander entered the Martian atmosphere headed for the South Pole. The mission up to this point had gone fairly well, but upon atmospheric entry, communications were lost, and attempts to re-establish contact with the spacecraft was not successful, with the lander remaining radio silent after it was expected to have landed. Attempts were made by the Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to locate the wreckage, but the lander was nowhere in sight. It remains lost to this day. The last anniversary for December the 3rd is in 2014, which is the day that the Japanese space agency JAXA launched the space exploration probe Hayabusa 2 from the Tanakashima Space Center on a six-year voyage to asteroid 162173 Ryugu. Upon arrival, it deployed four small rovers down to the surface, which would go on to take the first ever photographs from the surface of an asteroid. The Hayabusa 2 also collected samples from the surface of the asteroid, which are due to arrive back at Earth in just a few weeks, actually. So make sure you stay tuned to Space This Week for updates on the hopeful success of this sample recovery procedure. Next up, on December the 5th in 2014, we had the launch of Exploration Flight Test 1, which was the first flight of the Orion spacecraft, the spiritual successor to the Apollo spacecraft. Launched atop a mighty Delta IV Heavy, the Orion module successfully made it into space, where it completed its four-hour two-orbit flight. The second orbit featured a very high apogee that resulted in a very high energy re-entry at around 32,000 km per hour. This mission design emulates that of Apollo 4, which validated the Apollo flight control system and heat shield at re-entry conditions planned for the return from lunar missions. The Exploration Flight Test 1 mission was a success, and the Orion module used is now on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Our final anniversary of the week is on December the 6th, which marks the 1957 anniversary of a launch pad explosion of Vanguard TV-3, which thwarted the United States' first attempt to launch a satellite into Earth orbit. This was a real blow to the US in the space race, as the explosion followed the Soviet successes of both Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2. Luckily, the Americans wouldn't have to wait too much longer to see success. The Explorer 1 probe would be launched in January the following year and would end up reaching orbit successfully, the first American satellite to do so. But that's the final anniversary of the week and thus the conclusion of this week's history segment. <laughs> And so brings an end to another week of spaceflight events, spaceflight previews, and historical celebration. Out of curiosity, which of our three segments of the show do you prefer the most? I'm always looking at how the series can be refined or improved, so feedback is always very much appreciated. Let me know in the comments down below, but with that I see no reason to delay showcasing the end screen, which has a few things. To the left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist if you want to see more videos like this one, and on the right hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation AI. Hopefully it made a good choice. There's also a link to subscribe and check out my Patreon if you'd like to support the show monetarily, and in the description you can find links to stuff like Twitter, Discord, merchandise, etc, etc. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next Monday.